to Jesus. Tonight, you may be seated. Today we're speaking about what is called uh, what is called Hanukkah. The word Hanukkah means dedication. And we are going to take a few moments today to focus on one of the most mysterious, uh, I would call it a, a almost a New Testament um, a mystery. We start reading about Hanukkah, and because every other every other festival in the Bible, when it talks about the feast of the Lord, it tells us that we we find this out that as as they are revealed, they're revealed in the law. You have what is called uh, the Passover, Pentecost. You have uh, then that was revealed as uh, the Day of Atonement. Feast of Tabernacles, the major feasts of the Lord. And <clears throat> these are, like I said, they're, in, they're clearly, clearly laid out in the, Old, in the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. And we come to a, a modern day one, which I, would, I really can't call it modern day, but it's something that since we were New Testament, we came in understanding the New Testament, and then we learned how to, how to learn some of the secrets of the Old Testament. You find that uh, the way it's revealed, it's revealed in a, in a much, in a much different, uh, in a totally different manner. For instance, the Bible tells us when we read about it in the New Testament. This is why we should, this is why we should focus on it, or we should pay attention to it. In John ten twenty one through thirty, we're going to find these verses. That's a beautiful picture you found there. You notice it's different from the other menorah, right? The other one has seven, this has eight. In case you're new, this has eight, and the other one, the one in the Bible, the one in the book of Revelation has seven candlesticks. But in John 10, verse 20, uh, uh, 21 through 30, or shall I say, uh, yes. Others said, this is Jesus, his, his ministry is toward the end of his ministry. This is... Uh, it says, these are not the words of him that had the devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? This is, they're discussing who Jesus is. And it was at Jerusalem at the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. And this is where he is going to start clearing up their doubts. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Praise the Lord. So when we uh, look at this portion of Scripture, then we realize that the setting is this. This is a setting. That it's uh, from Hanukkah, which is the, uh, there's two months till Passover. So during that period of time is a very significant time. Here's where he shows himself, begins to tell them, begins much more plain language, who he is. And here's where he makes the greatest statement of all, and that is, I and my Father are one. Not in purpose, but they're one. The body is the flesh, that's the Son, and the Spirit, Father, is in him. So... He's try, trying to tell them plainly, but he said, finally, he said, have I told you? I'm doing the Father's works. Who am I? He, he's speaking out. They know he's a son. If anything, they call him the son of David, but he's trying to expose, expose himself and tell him, tell them that I am, I and my Father are one. In other words, he cannot say I am God because the Bible tells us this, that he, he refrains from the, what it's called, one man's witness is not true, but he can witness of himself because he's God. But he is so humble that he's not going to say, I am God. He says, I and my Father are one. 
And the Father is God. So when he makes that statement, that's when they start really getting angry. So that's a very uh, powerful statement. So he says this at the time of, uh, of the dedication. And it's because he's dedicating his life. Now he's got just two months to go into what is called the Passion. And so there's going to be a very important two months that he's going to enter into. And so this is why we look at it and say, well, there has to be more to this than meets the eye. We have to look at this thing and um, go back and do what history says about it and try to figure this thing out. Well, this thing begins, once we understand that he, that he celebrated that feast, we come to a, a realization, well, how, how are we going to explore this? There's a, there's a number of ways to do it, and, and I'm going to, I'm, they're, both of them are sort of complicated, and I, I want to try to keep it as simple as I can, by the grace of God. You'll pray for me while I go through this, right? Be prayerful with me. And uh, we're going to give you an expression. Now, this, like we mentioned before, this wasn't in the, in the, in the first five books of Moses. It was given to us in a, re in a real subtle way. Because Daniel, the, it, we're going to begin, I, I feel like taking you through Daniel the prophet. And, uh, no, I think I'll take it the other way. I think I'll be clear. We're going to go, I'm going to try something a little different. I think I got the leading here now. Let me see if I can find this real quick. <clears throat> Someone said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're going to start in Haggai. This is familiar, this is familiar to you. And the book of Haggai uh, tells us the second chapter in verse number 10. We're going to begin there. And we're going to read some very important points here. It tells us that in the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet, saying. And then it makes a statement concerning being clean and unclean. But, but I'm going to take you down to verse 14. I just wanted to show you the day that it's saying. It's, this is the eve. This is going to be the eve of what is called uh, Hanukkah. So, Go to verse 14. Then answered Haggai and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me. They're unclean, they're saying. Give them some questions. They say, yeah, it's unclean to do that. So he says, And so is this people, and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and that which they offer there is unclean. So their sacrifices, he said, they are unclean. He said, and now... I pray you, consider from this day on upward, from before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days were, when one came to a heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. And when one came to the uh, press fat to draw out fifty vessels out of the press, there were but twenty. I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail and all the labors of your hand ye turn not yet unto me, saith the Lord. So, he said this, from the first day of what we now know as, as Hanukkah, it wasn't known as Hanukkah then, it hadn't happened yet. So, but he's prophesying and he's saying, from this day forward, he said, you know, he said, from this day, he says, consider it. Consider why you're in the mess that you're in. He said, I want you to consider it really good. He said, you used to uh, go to the press fat to gain 50, and you only had 20. Uh, you, everything you wanted to do was diminished. You weren't blessed. Everything that you did, you, you weren't blessed. So he says, consider it. From this day, he said, it's, it, that, that's been your situation. You haven't been blessed. And then he makes a statement, before a foundation was laid. So, it's good. what we need to gather from this is that you need, to, you need to lay a good foundation in your life. Can you say amen? amen. You need to lay a good one. He says, you don't, before you laid a foundation, everything was, was a mess. Nothing worked out. Your finances were short. You, you didn't have enough to eat. The population was suffering. He said, and I want you to consider it. Think about it. And then he, then he turn, changes it around, and then he goes to verse 18. And he says, Consider now, from this day on upward, 
again, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, he said, now, from this point on, since the foundation is laid, I want you to consider this. Is the seed yet in the barn? Yeah. As yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive trees, they have not brought forth, but from this day I will bless you. So he said, guess what? From this day, consider it. You've been cursed somehow from this day in the past. You've been cursed. You've been living, you've been living uh, in an unblessed state, but you're my people. But he says, now consider this. From the time that you laid the foundation, one stone upon another, he said, from this day, I will bless you. Can you say amen? amen. Now he says, from this day, I will bless you. And again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai. His name means festival. In the four and twentieth day of the month, saying, it's again, this day is being emphasized. Speaking to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. So he makes a statement that in a future, in a future day, at about this time of the year, I am going to overthrow kingdoms. Things are going to be totally changed. In other words, he's telling them, you will not be the tail anymore, you're going to be the head. I'm going to take the nations off your back and I'm going to bless you. Because you remember what he said? From this day forward, I'm going to bless you. So that is the historical, uh, uh, or that is the blessing that is given from, the, from Haggai when yet they didn't know anything about, they didn't know anything about Hanukkah. It wasn't established yet. This is about 400 years before Jesus. All right, 400 plus years before Jesus comes. And so they're talking about from this day, you're going to be blessed. Now, this is the festival that Jesus attended. So we understand two things from this, that this day can be a, a day of cursing and it can be a day of blessing. If you have a foundation, it can be a day of, uh, if you have a foundation, it'll be a day of blessing. If you don't have a foundation on you, you can consider from this time a starting point that you're going to be under the curse or you're going to suffer want. The things are going to happen. Now, it's not a sin to suffer want because as Christians, we have to go through that. But I'm saying it won't happen over a lifetime. They never had good, they had bad days all the time. Are you with me? So this is very important that that day is either good or bad for you. From this day, things are going to happen that are either, you, you, you consider it. This is why bad things have happened to you. He said, because you were not in a state of holiness as a nation. Therefore, therefore, you don't, never had enough. Nations were coming in and taking from you. You were being conquered. You were under, you were under a dominion. And so this constantly came before them. Now, in, in the historical sense, now, I, I, that foundation is for this. Now, Haggai gave those, gave those prophecies. Then Daniel gave some prophecies. And we're going to go to what Daniel said. And Daniel gives, a very, gives us some greater insight. And we're going to go to Daniel chapter number 11, I believe it is. All right. Now, I'm going to give you the story here, or the events. It's a real event. It's not a once upon a time, right? It's a real event that took place. It's a historical event. And first of all, we'll read what happened. Now, when Daniel was given these verses, uh, people, that, when, when you study the Bible in Daniel 11, 27 to 33, when you study that, it's real confusing because... <clears throat> It is not understood that when Daniel prophesied about in the year four, might have been 425 in that era, in that era close. Uh, so he had, he, had, he had prophesied, he had written books, and these books that he had written had some strange, had a strange series of events. And people say, well, that's in the tribulation, that's in the book of, no. What he was doing 
that when the book of Malachi was written, and then when Jesus came, there were what we call 400 silent years. They were silent where no scriptures were written. No scriptures. Malachi was the last writer. And then it wasn't until, you know, we get the book of Matthew. But till Jesus came, there, there's what you call 400 silent years where you didn't have any prophets really prophesying. So Daniel wrote these prophecies, and he wrote them, and that's why you didn't need anybody prophesying, because he wrote what was going to happen during the 400 years. Are you with me there? So that's what he did. He wrote what was going to happen during that period of time. Now, there were two powers that were working for uh, uh, world domination. And one of them, Carthage, had been overthrown by the Romans. And then the Romans were fighting what were called the Greeks. And the Greeks were led under Antiochus Epiphanes. And he was a, 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 a great general that that was able to uh, conquer nations and take uh, uh, wealth from other individuals. And so there was a, a point in time when they started, he realized he's got to confront Rome, and there is going to be a struggle between them, him and Rome, the Greeks against the Romans. And this is what this portion of Scripture is going to be talking about right here, about the struggle between, this is where it begins. The, Antiochus Epiphanes wanted to conquer. He tried to make peace with what was called Egypt. He, uh, I believe, is going to send his daughter to marry into the lineage over there to make a truce with him. But things got all fouled up. And what happened is I believe his daughter sided with, uh, the plan fell through, his, his daughter, I believe, sided with uh, the king of the uh, Egyptians, the Ptolemies, uh, it was a family name. And so then he became furious. So the king of the north then came down to fight the king of the south. This is what this is about. So we'll read the verses now. And both, it says, both these kings' hearts shall do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table. They're, they're planning. And he was conspiring against Egypt. And it shall not prosper, for, ye, for the end shall be at the time appointed. Then shall he return to his land with great riches. This is Antiochus Epiphanes. And his heart shall be against the holy covenant, against the Jews. And he shall do exploits and return to his own land. So he didn't like the Jews because they had their own religion. And, and the Greeks didn't like the Jewish religion. And so he had, he was trying to arrange politically. He wanted them to be their friends, but he had, they were conquered under him. They were under his reign. Now, at that point in time, he becomes so infuriated that his plans fell through, so he attacks, or he takes his army to attack Rome. Now, this is where this verse comes in. For the ships of Shittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So what it's saying there is that when he went, this is what history says, that he went down there, and right where he got to the borders of Alexandria to fight the Egyptians, the ships of Shittim, which was the name of the Roman, this is a name given to the Romans in the Bible, in this portion. What happened is that the ships from Rome appeared in Alexandria, at the port of Alexandria. And the, an envoy came off, a small escort came and met Antiochus Epiphanes there outside of Alexandria. And so when they appeared, he went over there and he gave them a decree from Rome and it said, leave Egypt alone. And again, he read it, and he said, I'm going to go back with my generals, and we're going to discuss this. But the, the Roman envoy got a stick and drew a circle, walked around Antiochus Epiphanes, walked around and drew a circle. And then he said, before you leave that circle, give me an answer. That's the power of Rome. And so he became so upset, Antiochus became so upset that his plans had gone up in smoke and that the, and that the Romans had, he was now uh, directly opposed and there's nothing he could do. So he said, what Rome says to do, I will obey. 
And he was, uh, he was publicly put to shame by the Romans. Because he didn't want a war with Rome at that point in time. So he turned around, and this is where he becomes so angry that he takes it out on the Jews. And when he goes back, he, makes, he, he, goes, into, uh, he goes over into Jerusalem, and this is where, this is where the story of Hanukkah really begins. On the, on the, listen, they went, they assembled their army, they took their people over there, and on the 24th, 25th day of Chislu, which, is the, which was going to be the first day of Hanukkah, this is the first day that he went, he defiled the temple. They cleared it out. They killed a pig and put blood of an altar, uh, of the altar of, in Jerusalem. They put up a statue of Zeus, and he says, this is what you're going to worship. And it happened on the, what was going to be the first day of the Feast of Hanukkah. So I'm telling you the, secret, the unknown parts right, of, of what took place. Now, there was a war for three years. And for three years, uh, the, they had a guerrilla warfare, the Jews against the Greeks, Antiochus Epiphanes. And they would, they, they, they would go from place to place to the high places. They would get the main men, uh, Antiochus' soldiers would, and they would command them to worship Zeus and to bow down to Zeus. And they refused to, so they realized that they had to flee because they were killed. Various individuals were killed. At one point, they came to the house of Maccabee, which was going to become the house of the Maccabees. They went in there and they told them to worship. And the... And, and, their father was old, and he said, I'm not going to worship. One of the sons, Judas Maccabee, jumped in, killed the messenger, and from that point, the war was on. The rebellion was on. And all the men of Israel fled up into the mountains, and they began a campaign of three years of fighting, uh, the, fighting the Greeks. Well, after three years of fighting, they, they expelled the Greeks and they won the war. And it wasn't coincidence that on the dip, exactly three years later to the day, they came to the temple, they moved certain stones away, they cleansed it, and from that day forward, they established what was called Hanukkah, or they rededicated the temple. When they rededicated it, notice, God always does things in a secular manner. Three years before, on, on, the 20, on the 25th day, it was defiled. Now, what's so interesting about this is that it was like a type of the Antichrist, how the Antichrist will defile the temple. Are you with me? Well, this was an exact three and a half years, but he, what happens, he defiles, called, and he... And he brought forth what, what is called the abomination that make it desolate. In other words, an altar of Zeus was set up there in that portion. So this is why he's a type and a shadow of the Antichrist. He was not the Antichrist, but it, we understand that that's the kind of defilement that's going to take place when, when, uh, the, when the real Antichrist appears. So, three and a half years later, on the festival of, uh, excuse me, on the on the 25th day of the ninth month, and it runs all the way to the, like the second day of the 10th month, that's what it's called Hanukkah. So why is it called Hanukkah? Because they dedicated, they rededicated the temple. Now, what was the, what was the big deal? Well, when they, did, when they defiled the, the temple, they lost their identity in a sense that they could not worship and they lost their freedom of worship. The festival of the dedication points to that we have a right and we have the freedom to worship. That we have, we have, if we have to be by, we do it by spiritual warfare, but we remember that on this day, wait, Jesus celebrated that day, the feast of the dedication, and we should dedicate ourselves uh, to worship 
and from this day forward be blessed for the rest of the year. Would you give the Lord a clap offering? So this is what it, this is what it points to. That notice, remember what, remember what uh, Haggai said? He said, consider from this day, there's a curse. All right, they killed a pig on the temple. And then later, consider this day forward. He says, from that day, I will bless you. From that day, they could worship on the, on the temple. So you see that in between the Testaments, this prophecy was fulfilled that they, could, they would be cursed on that day and they would be blessed on that day. It all depends on his people what side or what they want in their lives for the rest of that year or going forward. I wouldn't even say for, for the rest of that year. We should desire, for instance, from this day forward, we want to be blessed. Amen. We want to receive God's best. Yes. Yeah. We want to not be diminished in everything that we do. Nothing work out, but we want the blessing of God in our lives. How do we gain it? By dedicating on a continual basis. By putting your, making a mark in your spirit, in your spiritual calendar, and say, you know, I'm going to dedicate from this point onward, even though I've been dedicated, I'm going to rededicate, and I'm going to keep going forward, and I'm going to allow God. I'm not going to hinder him in any way, because I want the blessing of God in my life. So whatever you have not been doing right, perhaps, during this period of time, do it right from this day forward. Don't be diminished in the things that you do for God. So you see the link? You see how it links up together? How that God said in one portion, cursing or blessing. Then in between the Testaments, it's written in history what took place. And we even know what Antiochus Epiphanes did, how he defiled it. But on the same day, three years later, they get they get it all back because they fought for it. When you dedicate or you want to dedicate, there's always going to be a fight involved. It doesn't come through peaceful manners. It comes through spiritual warfare in your life. Every time, no other way. The way it happens. He said, don't think that I, Jesus, don't think that I ain't come to bring peace. No, I am come to bring a sword what he said against family members it, it said it flat out like that mother-in-law against daughter-in-law father against son it, it tells us that that when you make spiritual decisions there's going to be a war yeah and things are going to happen between you and family it cannot be avoided if you live for God hard it's going to happen don't think like some strange things has happened to you. No, count yourself blessed. You have to count yourself blessed that there is conflict because somebody is making the proper choice. You cannot compromise when you live for God. Because when you do, you end up living under the curse. Now they took up arms, they cleansed the temple, and they became it took, they had a temple from that point on all the way till Jesus came. They started rebuilding their temple during that period of time. They went back in there and they started rebuilding. Uh, and, and, and later on, Herod uh, beautifies the temple and gives them a place of worship. So this is to be understood that this is what this time of the year points to. Now, another portion that we find In, in, give me just a moment just to bring this up. In Hanukkah, then, then we can go back and understand a few things. I'm just about done today. How about that? Hey, I'm proud of myself. <laughs> yeah, I don't have to go, feeling, go home feeling guilty. And when I do go feel guilty, not for very long. <laughs> so. Now, <clears throat> This is why then you, really, you see some things in the Bible that 
That's, a, that's the main Bible study right there. You sort of get that. This is why we do what we do. But just to give you a, two, two more examples. They didn't know about the Feast of Tabernacle, but those days were here. The Bible says about the Noah's flood. It said, the waters were decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month on the first day of the month. Well, that would be on day 7 or possibly day 8 of what is called the day of Hanukkah. So what happened at that point in time? In the seventh month, the ark landed. But on the, on the tenth month, on the first day, the Bible says all the tops of the mountains were seen. So they realized God's kept his promise. There's, they were in the boat on top, up on top of the rocky ledge, but it says that from, that from their vantage point, they looked around and the tops of the mountains began to see and hope started coming into their lives. A newness. The, the new creation was coming to fruition. Everything that God said that he had brought them safely to the other side of the flood and now they were looking at it. Can someone say amen? amen. So you see that these days continue to pop up. Now it tells us this. And it came to pass in the 600th uh, and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month. So from Hanukkah till, which is the month number 10, all the way to the first beginning of the year, which is probably around it, about two months, two and a half months, that from that point in time, oh, don't go get away from me, uh, that, let me see what happened. That Noah, Remove the covering from off the ark. And it was revealed, the contents of the ark are revealed, so they take the covering off. So what it wants to point out is there is a blessing from the tent all the way to that first month. Remember, there is blessing. The blessings are upon this family now, and they're going to come out in the, in the second month. One more instance in Ezra, it says this. Ezra 10, 16 through 17, the nation had become very idolatrous. They, had, they were not obeying the, the, the law. And so here's what t transpires there. The Bible says in Ezra, and the children of the captivity, uh, Ezra 10, 16 to 17, and the children of the captivity did so, and Ezra the priest, and certain chief of the fathers after the house of their fathers, and all of them by their names were separated and sat down in the first day of the 10th month to examine the matter. What was the matter here? Well, the matter was they had been under the curse because all the men had married, many of the men had married, especially in the priests that had married foreign wives that were not Israel, uh, of, of the nation of Israel. So on this day, on the last day of Hanukkah, what is now the last day of Hanukkah, they sat down and began to take the names. All right, this is... You know, you're checked off. You're not eligible. You're not eligible. You're not, you know, he started pointing them out. They started cleaning house, in other words, because they wanted the blessing. And so then it tells us in verse 17, and they made an end with all the men that had taken strange, strange wives by the first day of the first month. So up to that first month, at that point in time, the whole list was complete. People had gone out, figured this thing out, and they said, the list ended at that point in time. In other words, on the first day of the first month was a new year, and they wanted to start out blessed. Now, this is why God to this day gives us these lessons to understand this, that we need markers in our life to be blessed. Yeah. Yeah. The Bible says today is the day of salvation, for instance. Well, they're markers. Wherever it was that you were baptized, that's a marker for you. When you got the Holy Ghost, that's a marker for you. When you, God opened your eyes uh, for, for doctrine, and everyone needs doctrine. Without doctrine, you're not a disciple. You ever realize that? Without doctrine, that you're not a disciple. That's what, that's what the word means. That's how, you, uh, uh, that's how you become a disciple, through doctrine. When you get doctrine, you discipline yourself, you line up with that, and you become blessed. So, 
we, we, we realize this, and that from that time they cleansed themselves and the blessing was on after that point in time. Isn't it interesting? No, no, this will be, but it doesn't say it's, it's the first part of the month, but it, it says, So Esther was taken into King Ashuheras into the royal, into his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month of Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign. So that's interesting there, that this is where a great event took place also. So, how, how should it affect you and I? Well, I want to urge you to do this. This coming year, pick yourselves out without being proud of you. Take a day of fasting. I, I, real, I, I, I found that some of you are just sort of like a mantle that's falling on you and you're starting to fast on your own without us calling a fast. Because it's your personal walk. It's where, it's where sometimes the Holy Ghost just tells you, you know, you got to do something different. You don't have enough energy. You don't have enough spiritual power. You don't, you're going through too many problems. You should be blessed. And what happens when you don't clear, clear, you know, get clarity in your mind, you end up in a zone where you're doubting. And you're, why, Lord? You're in the doubt session. Well, I can tell you this. It's not God's fault. <laughs> it's never God's fault. It's not like God forgot about you because he's busy over there, you know, with, that brother over there that seemed to get it all together. No. Simply because it's it, the blessings, you neglected certain things. So uh, these things come into our lives. But you can pick it out when you start getting into a doubtful situation. And then you start all the reasons why, why, why. Well, what you need to start looking at, you know, I need, to look, I need a solution. And the solution has to start right here. I've always had to go back to them. In, in growing up in my ministry, I always had it. Why aren't we having revival? This is that. We do this and that. And I always had to come back to this one situation. I've got to just simply do my part. I can't bring revival, but I've got to do my part. And when I do my part, I'm not asking anymore. Why aren't we having revival? I just have revival in my spirit. Yeah. yeah. Why, why aren't, you know, why, why are they, you know, down, down over here having a great outbreak in a, no, because we're not supposed to be looking around. We're supposed to be making sure this person is having revival. And this is what God is. He's reaching out to you today, and he wants you to have, grab a hold of revival. Yeah. Pray, and, and once you pray, get a good attitude. Things are going to change. Believe, and you shall receive. And when, you, and when you beat down the, 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 the little foxes, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little thoughts that constantly don't let faith grow. Those are the ones, you know, that if you're a negative person, stop being negative because you're only hurting yourself. And you, you, you'll drag others around you, no doubt. You'll drag them down. But you're only hurting yourself every time. Therefore, you learn to have faith. I can't tell you, I don't believe positive thing. And I tell you, have faith. Have, having faith is always positive. I don't, want to, I don't want you to have an emotional thing. I want you to have a working faith. Yeah, the joy comes up on its own. You have to deal with the faith part. The faith gives you, once you have faith, faith is always positive. Is it not? It's yes. The Bible says that his promises are yes and amen. They are positive. Therefore, when you start getting a hold of faith, you're, you become naturally positive. Because you can only be positive. But you gotta beat, you've got to beat the foul off the sacrifice. You've got to beat them away. You've got thoughts, all these issues. And, and when, you, when you deal with self, then start you'll start progressing, you start going forward. And it might be tomorrow, things start changing, it might be a week or so, but the change has to be coming here. You have to make sure change has to come here. And even if things don't change out there, if they're changing here, in the meantime, everything's all right. Because you are waiting, you have hope, you've got a promise, all these issues are gonna pass away, this problem came, to, it, it, and it came to pass. You're going you're gonna to leave it behind you in the, in the near future. So hold fast, have faith, and your situation is going to turn around. Stand with me tonight.
<clears throat> Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Do we have any announcements that we need to make? All right, let's, we'll have... She, she listen up, because she's going to stay down there. First of all, those of you that are all about the menorahs, um, the Hanukkah menorah, we have a problem with the um, wiring. It's that we cannot afford bulbs, all right? We can afford bulbs. So I just want you to, if it's bothering you, it's that we couldn't get the light bulb way over to the other side because uh, something's wrong. So we got to check that, brothers, um, right afterwards. But anyway, somebody brought it to my attention. Just It might be bothering somebody. Let me say this, too, while we have it up here. This is, a, this is a custom. Now, if it were up to me, I'd have eight bulbs here, okay? Right. But the Jews, they have a thousand ways to turn right. things around and make things interesting. So, one school of thought is, for every day you add a bulb. For eight days, all right? There's another more negative group that have eight of them, and they start taking one away. You know, but since I am a true Jew, I'd like to have them all up. <laughs> all right, yeah, that's, so that's, a, that's a thing. And this is always stands as, a, as the servant. Mm -hmm. This is the